have. Good morning, good morning, and welcome to All Saints this morning. Let us sing our opening hymn, number one, uh, 147, in the red and black hymnal. Lift every voice and sing, Come Ye Disconsolate.
Blessed be the one holy and living God. Glory to God forever and ever. Almighty God. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known and from you. No secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and merciful God, it is only by your gift that your faithful people offer you true and laudable service. Grant that we may run without stumbling to obtain your heavenly promises. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of Ruth. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judea went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of the wife Naomi and of the sons Malin and Chilion. They were Ephratites from Bethlehem in Judea. They went into the country of Moab and remained there, but Elimelech, the husband of Naomi died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other, Ruth. When they had lived there about ten years, both Malin and Chilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where they had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you. Go back to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them and they wept aloud. They said to her, no, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters. 
go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters. It has been far more bitter for me than for you because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, see, your, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die. There, I will be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well, if even death parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. The word of the Lord.
a reading from the lesson from the letter to the Hebrews. When Christ came as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls, with the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer, sanctifies those who have been defiled so that their flesh is purified, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God. The word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord one of the scribes came near and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, Which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, The first is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all the heart and with all understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When the Lord saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared to ask him any questions. The Gospel of the Lord Naomi says to Naomi, uh, Ruth says to Naomi, do not, press, do not press me to leave you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. I speak to you in the name of one God, creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. She saw that she was determined. Determination, according to the Google, <laughs> is a positive emotional feeling that involves persevering towards a difficult goal in spite of obstacles. Determination occurs prior to goal attainment and serves to motivate behavior that will achieve one's goal. So when was the last time you were determined to do something? When did you last feel so inwardly motivated that no matter the obstacles, 
you were going to achieve your goal. It doesn't have to be anything major. It just, have to, it just has to involve challenges that need to be overcome and a will that nothing will get in your way. For example, I had a friend who recently said, even with all of the material shortage and the supply chain issues, I am determined to find the best Halloween costume. <laughs> or another friend in grad school says, I am determined to get an A on this assignment because it's so important. I'll even study all weekend long. And even myself, last week, I was determined to find Joffrey Ballet Nutcracker tickets for the exact day that my mom will be visiting in December, even though it's on a Friday, which is the most popular day. But I got them. <laughs> I was determined. The important thing I want you to remember is that when we believe something is important enough, when we feel that we have the energy and motivation, the obstacles that are in our way don't stand a chance because those challenges, no matter how great, seem minuscule compared to the high value we place on completing the important task. This morning, we have been given a gift. Our first passage is from Ruth. Ruth is a short book that we only hear once in our lectionary cycle, once every three years. Technically, it's twice, this week and next week. But since we're celebrating All Saints Day next week, we're not doing the Ruth reading. So this is it. This is all we have. And today's sermon is dedicated to putting Ruth in the spotlight she most desperately deserves. Ruth is one of my favorite books in Hebrew scriptures because it is packed full of theological meaning and insight in just four short chapters, just 80 verses. This little book packs a big drama. It is a novella with famine, foreign lands, death, alienation, hardship, love, trickery, sex, <laughs> resilience, and ending with new life. It's an amazing story, but it would be impossible to share all the details um, this morning so I just want to highlight one that came to me recently. And it's, and it's how, when we're faced with the how when we're faced in difficult times, how to make a decision. And I think this story really captures the gamut of what our human experience can hold. Some things that are motivated by the world and some things that are motivated by God. But before we go into the text, I want, I'm going to invite you to think about some things about yourself before introducing Ruth. Do you struggle with taking risks and facing uncertainty? Is your default in life to take the safe and predictable path? Do you ever feel alone? And if so, do you feel that you deserve to feel this way? so weighed down with burden or grief or anxiety that the thought of sharing such weight seems unthinkable? Or are you fed up with the way things are, filled with inner truth that things don't have to stay the same, that burdens can be lifted, that things can be better? The story shows our human condition in all its various forms, but it is the determination of Ruth even in the face of despair, that I'm going to emphasize this morning. So let's dive in. The story begins with Naomi and her Israelite family from Bethlehem experiencing a famine. The situation is so bad that they are willing to move to Moab. Now, this is an important detail. Judeans hate Moabites. Horrible. It's kind of like in the Good Samaritan where Jews hate Samaritans, that the Samaritans are the lowliest of low in society. They're subhuman. They're looked down upon. Same thing here. Moabites equal bad. So you have this family that's leaving all that they own, all that they know, and they're moving to the worst place that they could possibly imagine. 
Once in Moab, this trial and tribulation does not end. Noemi's husband dies. Her two sons marry Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. But after a time, those two sons die, leaving all three women childless and alone. Just a reminder, in the ancient world, things were always difficult to be a woman, but they were especially difficult when there's no men around. They were stricken with grief, but they also were left with very few options on how to survive the situation. With such few options, Naomi made the decision to go back home to Judah, but to do so alone, resigned to the misplaced fact that for whatever reason, God was punishing her, and she deserves all this misfortune. Orpah and Ruth want to come with her, but Naomi also knows what their life would be like in Judah, what it would be like for Moabites to have to live among the Judeans. Life would be too difficult for you if you came with me, Naomi said. Go back. Leave me, I beg you. I'm not worth it. Orpah turns back. She's going to miss Naomi, but she understands her mother-in-law's plea. This seems pretty too scary, maybe too risky to go with Naomi, Orpah probably thought. But Ruth is different. Ruth persists. Scripture even says that she clung to Naomi. And after one last plea from Naomi to Ruth to turn back and go home, Ruth responds with one of the most beautiful pieces of poetry in Scripture. Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. And so she goes on. And that is when Naomi realized Ruth's determination. That's when she knew that no matter the obstacles that lay ahead of them, no matter the persecution or hardship, Ruth was going to attain her goal of staying with Naomi, of loving Naomi. And thank God she did, because without the act of this determination, without her determination, the rest of the story would have never happened. We won't hear it next week, so I'll spoil the ending for you. Ruth will bear a son, and that son will be the grandfather of King David, whom Jesus directly descends from. Much can be gleaned from this really rich, beautiful story, but I want to focus on the three women and their various ways of reacting to their situation. I'm not one for congregational participation, but I'm going to go out on a limb. I'm going to invite you to enter into the story yourself. That's fine. I'm okay. I want you to enter into the story and try to place yourself in whom you most identify with in this story. Is it Orpah, wanting to maintain relationship, but when given an easier option, turns back? What about Naomi? Do you feel like You have to face this harsh world all by yourself. Do you think your baggage, that your weight is only yours to carry and that you don't want to burden anyone else with it? Or maybe you're Ruth, filled with the knowledge that life is truly too short to to not share love with those who need it most. Before continuing, I want to be very clear. I'm going to say two things. One, God does not make bad things happen. God is not responsible for Naomi's suffering, no matter what she thinks she's done. God is not responsible for our suffering, no matter, what we th- no matter how much we think we may deserve it. And number two, there is nothing wrong with what Orpah did. Sometimes in life, the right thing to do is to care for ourselves and to seek safety. But what I'm about to say next is meant to encourage you to not always default to what is safe, but rather to act out of determination in hopes of helping God redeem whatever situation needs divine intervention. 
you see our God, again, doesn't make bad things happen. Those things are because of the existence of evil. But our God, the God that we believe in, is a God of redemption. A God that can redeem any situation, no matter how terrible. That's what we call bringing the kingdom of heaven here on earth. Actualizing God's redeeming works here and now. With me? Now, I say this a lot, but I say it because it's important. God is not a puppet master. God needs our help. The work of the church is not passive. Yes, we do come here and we pray and we worship and we come and we are fed. But we do it all so that we can be agents of God's completing God's will. We are called to be active participants. We are called to be people of action. A people so filled with determination that no matter what is in our way, whether we are faced with sorrow or grief or homelessness or white supremacy or whatever evil exists in front of us, no matter the obstacle, the, the determination that stirs, that has stirred, is stirring in this place, deep within our bones and in our bodies, that will be the thing that brings about God's reign. That is the thing that helps God achieve God's goal. It is human nature to seek safety when we feel threatened like Orpa. And in our Western society and culture, the one that promotes individualism, like Naomi, it is natural to feel that we can't or shouldn't share our burdens. But what Ruth does in this story, what she models for us with her determination is an opportunity for God to be invited into our world, to use us to make a difference for what God envisions for all of us. I'm not saying God doesn't work through the Orpahs or the Naomi's. I'm too smart to know that the moment I start putting God into a box, that that's the moment that I'm trying to limit how powerful our God is. But in this text, I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you that through the action of Ruth, through her love, through her determination, she brings about God's redeeming works. I know I'm preaching to the choir. I like this. I like that you all understand all of this. <laughs> I don't have to tell you to look around. I don't have to tell you to see all the people who are struggling, who are deeply, deeply, deeply hurting in this world. It's a hard place to be. There are so many Naomi's right now, I can't even tell you how it saddens me. We need God's redeeming work now more than ever. We need the love that was mentioned in the gospel, that greatest commandment kind of love, that call to action kind of love now more than ever. And this morning, what my prayer is for all of us, for all of you, for me, is that may your internal motivation for love and justice that has been stirred and is still stirring to this day, may it fill you once again. May Ruth be a reminder of what is important in this life. And may it turn into that God-given determination that is the only sure way of beginning to heal this broken world. Amen.
We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty. Let us pray that our lives and actions may make a difference for the people of our world, saying, Living God, fill us with your spirit. God of connection, continue to bless, gather, and unite our church and all those who long to be your agents of good and love in this world. For Paula, our chosen bishop for Chicago, for Suzanne, our rector, for Andrew, and for Courtney, our priests, and for all the people of all saints, Living God, fill us with your spirit. Gracious God, give to us a discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships, so that we may all live deep within the heart of God. Living God, God, our refuge and strength, bless us with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people, so that we may work for justice, freedom, and peace. Living God, compassionate God, give to us tears to shed for all who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war, so that we may reach out our hands to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. Living God, Fill us with your spirit. Holy One, enable us to see the beauty of this world and the blessings of our lives. Living God, fill us with your spirit. Lord, our God, imbue us with enough foolishness to believe that we can make a difference in this world so that we can do what others claim cannot be done. Living God, Fill us with your spirit. God of hope, nurture tenderness in our hearts to pray for all the departed. Living God, fill us with your spirit. Almighty and eternal God, ruler of all things in heaven and earth, mercifully accept the prayers of your people and strengthen us to do your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sins to God. God of Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through the grace of Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life.
The peace of the Lord be always with you. Good morning and welcome to All Saints. Please have a seat. Um, as we are about to proceed with the offertory, I thought first we might hear about pledging from our one of our wardens, Scotty Caldwell. Good morning. Um, as I am, have no doubt you're aware if you are on our newsletter list or have been attending services any time in the last few weeks, it's pledge time! <laughs> Yay! Um, and so I want to talk about why I give to All Saints and why I pledge to All Saints. Um, and I am incapable of answering this question without beginning in a similar way to the way I answer the question of why do you want to be an actor? Um, if you don't know, I moved to Chicago to perform in our incredible theater scene. Um, been a bit less of that lately, but the arts are coming back, baby. Um, but the answer is like, when, oh, when did you want to know, when did you want to be an actor? I always was. I played dress up and then just never stopped. Um, and why I give to my church is a similar story. I think it was the earliest lesson from the second commandment that Jesus shares in the gospel today is love your neighbor as yourself. And so from the time I was the littlest child, I knew that I was called to give what I could to help others. Um, and so God, God asked of me to give what I can, and I believe that God wants me to help the world be a better place. And so giving to all saints is why I do that. Um, and that's been lifelong. I moved to Chicago in 2008 and have been at All Saints ever since. And so that Why I Give story became more specific to this place. I give because I want to support our programming and our outreach. I want to support what happens within these walls and the transformation and the love that we bring to the world outside of these walls. Um, as over the years that I've spent here and uh, shared fellowship and worship and many years of vestry responsibilities that has deepened to include this idea that I give of my resources because when I needed help, All Saints gave of its resources to help me on an individual level and on an institutional level. And I, now that I have been lifted up by that help, want to share that with the rest of you, and with everyone who has yet to walk through our doors. Um, and then in the last few years, as you know, I've, I, again, this is all about me. <laughs> I've had a fairly eventful tenure as your co-warden. Um, we, we called Suzanne after a lengthy search process to be our rector. We had, unfortunately, and are still in the midst of surviving a catastrophic global pandemic. Um, and um, specifically, I want the rectory uh, that Rob Lentz talked about last week to be a wreck no longer. <laughs> I want it to be a sturdy, warm, up to code home where our rector's family can live comfortably and where our congregation will feel welcome for years and years to come. And finally, the most recent thing that has been in my prayers and on my heart when I consider why I pledge and why I give of what I have to my church um, is uh, as the conversation around labor and human value has really started to shift hopefully rapidly for the better in our society I want this church to be a place where we honor and fully compensate and adequately compensate our staff members and not just our clergy and so part of why I am giving to All Saints is because I want our budget to expand to be able to offer extremely good compensation to those who give so many of their gifts and talents to this place. Um, so yeah, that is the journey, that is why I give and what's been on my 
heart and in my thoughts lately, I hope that you'll join me in pledging to All Saints for next year. If you're new to pledging, uh, either in the Episcopal Church or any church, come say hey after the service. I'm happy to chat anyway. I end up staying afterwards to chat anyway. So please feel free to say hello. And the uh, last little thing I'll share is that many folks, me included, have set up auto pay from our bank to send our pledge directly to All Saints, which is wonderful for sort of uh, cash flow stability throughout the year. So thank you so much for doing that. However, if you're like, yes, I am in, I am pledging, I'm planning to continue my auto pay, please still click the link that says, I pledge this much to All Saints. It's in our weekly newsletter and it's on our website because we have to know what your pledge will be as we build our budget for next year. So thank you so much for your gifts. Thank you so much for your past and future support of this place. And please click the link. Thank you. <laughs> one of our most generous people with certainly um, time and talent for sure. Um, and of course, our generosity comes out of the generosity of God, God's self, which we meet at this table. And I want everyone here to know that whether you just walked through the door or whether you've been here for a super long time, you are welcome at God's table at communion. The bread is for all. Um, at communion, the way that we take communion here is we come in front of the pews on all sides in a row and um, you, play, you open your hands and into your open empty hands we will place the gift of bread, uh, the bread of life. Um, if you prefer not to take communion today, please still come forward, cross your arms over your chest and we will give you a blessing. And we also have gluten-free wafers for those who need them, just ask the priest as we come by. Now, now let us with gladness present um, the offerings and oblations of our lives and our labors unto the Lord. This Eucharist is offered in thanksgiving for the life of Mary Gallagher and for the repose of her soul, sister of parishioner Julie Donalek. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
We praise you and we bless you, holy and gracious God, source of life abundant. From before time, you made ready the creation. Your spirit moved over the deep and brought all things into being, sun, moon, and stars, earth, winds, and waters, and every living thing. You made us in your image and taught us to walk in your ways. But we rebelled against you and wandered far away. And yet, as a mother cares for her children, you would not forget us. Time and again, you called us to live in the fullness of your love. And so this day, we join with saints and angels in the chorus of praise that rings through eternity, lifting our voices to magnify you as we sing. Glory and honor and praise to you, holy and living God, to deliver us from the power of sin and death and to reveal the riches of your grace. You looked with favor upon Mary, your willing servant, that she might conceive and bear a son, Jesus, the holy child of God. Living among us, Jesus loved us. He broke bread with outcasts and sinners, healed the sick, and proclaimed good news to the poor. He yearned to draw all the world to himself, yet we were heedless of his call to walk in love. Then the time came for him to complete upon the cross the sacrifice of his life and to be glorified by you. On the night before he died for us, Jesus was at table with his friends. He took bread, gave thanks to you, broke it, gave it to them and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. As supper was ending, Jesus took the cup of wine. Again, he gave thanks to you, gave it to them and said, drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for all for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Now gathered at your table, O God of all creation, and remembering Christ crucified and risen, who was and is and is to come, we offer to you our gifts of bread and wine and ourselves a living sacrifice. Pour out your spirit upon these gifts that they may be the body and blood of Christ. Breathe your spirit over the whole earth and make us your new creation, the body of Christ given for the world you have made. In the fullness of time, bring us with all your saints from every tribe and language and people and nation to feast at the banquet prepared from the foundation of the world. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, to you be honor, glory, and praise forever and ever. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine
These are the gifts of God, and we are the people of God. Let us pray. God of abundance, 
you have fed us with the bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and one another, and you have made us one with all your people in heaven and on earth. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Christ our Savior. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Mother to us all, be with you today and remain with you always. Please be seated for a few announcements. But before announcements, although it is the last day of October, we're pretending it's the first day of November and we're celebrating birthdays and anniversaries because next week we know it'll just be two crazy pants in here. So anyone celebrating an anniversary or birthday or other joyous thing in November, please stand and share. Yes, please. 64, congratulations. Gina. Love it. Beautiful. Standing? Yay! All right. Eileen. Woo! 75. Okay. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Wait a second, Colin. I got distracted by us on video. Did you say you were going to turn 60? <laughs> Elizabeth. 58, yay. That's two 1111s, and I think we have some joys from the folks watching online. Just one today. Uh, Mike Burke says that Oliver Burke, grandson of Mike and Katie Burke, will be 15 on the 4th. Yay! Well, let us wish them all many years. Announcements for the good of the order. Do we have a vestry person who would like to welcome? Jacqueline, I'm going to let you do two announcements. <laughs> and Gina, I see you. I see you. <laughs> okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Jacqueline Wingite. I'm a member of the vestry here. Um, so if you are new, we want to welcome you. We're so happy you're here. Um, I think someone can ha hold up, Lori, if you can hold up the red book in the back. Um, you can sign in uh, and put your email in, and then you'll start to get our newsletters. Maybe one of our clergy will take you out for coffee. Um, so please do, uh, you know, come say hi. Um, I'd be very happy to meet you. Um, and then secondly, uh, I am doing the Revive Christmas Basket sign-up today. 
they're not baskets, they're boxes. I don't know why we call them baskets. But anyways, moral of the story, um, it, we have 25 families um, that do not have the resources to give Christmas gifts to each other. So um, if you are interested, come over. I have my computer. I'm just going to have you sign up on the online form. There was also um, a link to it in the newsletter as well, if you need to take some time and think about it. But if you want to just sign up right after church, um, come do see me. Um, there are families of uh, one or two people and then families of three or four. Um, so you can specify how big of a family you'd like to give. Just keep in mind we ask that at a minimum um, you spend 40 to $45 per person on gifts. Um, and if you want to spend more, you can do that. Just kind of try to make sure that things are a bit even um, in how much you spend. We'll, we'll have suggestions of gifts, the uh, names of everyone in the family, um, their ages, so that can help guide you perhaps. Um, and like lots more instructions on what to do. You'll also need to buy a gift card to Jewel Osco grocery store um, that amounts to $15 per person so that the family can uh, buy themselves a lovely Christmas dinner. Um, the, we're thinking, we haven't gotten the exact date when they're going to pick up the boxes, but we're anticipating probably they'll pick up um, the, that like, it's like the last week of November, first week of December, it's kind of like split, awesome. so we'd want the gifts here um, by the 28th. Um, so thank you um, if you have any questions come see me thanks Jacqueline I'll be in the back I know we have at least one more announcement <laughs> I am Gina Shropshire and I am here to get you excited about our special All Saints Day which is coming up next Sunday and and if you haven't been here for All Saints Day, we do something that is really, really wonderful. We uh, invite our departed loved ones into the sanctuary with us on that day. We put their names and anything that we want the church to know about them on these pieces of paper. Imagine me writing something here. And we hang these along with beautiful Mexican paper flags from the rafters so our loved ones are all around us as we celebrate our special All Saints Day. It's really wonderful, so I hope that you will do this. Now, there is also the hanging of these names from the rafters, which if you are feeling like you would like to spend a little bit of extra contemplative time in the church, we will be hanging the flags Friday and Saturday, and you can sign up to do that? No, you can do up, And the times are in the bulletin and the newsletter. Well, there you go. So it's a good time to come and be in the church. It's very low key. You can put your own flag up, and you can also spend a little bit of time just being in this beautiful space. So there, that's it. Gina, the queen of all saints. <laughs> Okay, I think that is probably sufficient other than to remind you Episcopal 101 is coming up. You can see the bulletin for information about that, um, but you do need to sign up for that, please. Um, so check out your newsletter. And now, why don't we rise and sing an, a, an oldie but a goodie, number 60, and lift every voice and sing the black and red hymnal, How Great Thou Art.
Let us go forth in the name of Christ. Thanks be to God.